Welcome to the show. Upcoming tour dates Tuesday, tomorrow night, November 19th. That will be at the historic uh, Fox Theater in Bakersfield. Wednesday night, Fresno, Warner Center. Thursday, November 21st, State Theater, Modesto. Friday, November 22nd, Bob Hope Theater in Stockton. And then November 23rd, Visalia Fox Theater. All these dates are with the great Bill Burr. New Year's Eve, I will be rocking the Comedy Cellar in Las Vegas. And some fresh 2025 dates have just come up. That will be at the Punchline in San Francisco, February 26, 27, 28, and March 1st. Also, Patreon. Join the Patreon. Bonus episode is coming up. I will be talking about our incredible day at uh, in Ojai yesterday, doing the... Uh, what was that? It was like the uh, Libby Amphitheater. Oh, my God, it was cool. Bill and I were out there with some great friends. I'll be talking about that. I'll be talking about uh, the best pastrami sandwich in America. I will talk about the St. Louis Flyover Comedy Festival that I just did. And uh, the Alex Van Halen book, which I've been deeply uh, enjoying and rocking on these long road trips and flights. My guest today is the return of my good friend, J.J. French, who is here to celebrate the 40th anniversary of their incredible record, Stay Hungry. Uh, one of my favorite songs of that era of the 80s is Stay Hungry, 100%. I also love Burn in Hell. Uh, you know, one of the most licensed songs ever in the history of music is We're Not Gonna Take It, of course, and I Want to Rock. This man, uh, we talk all kinds of stuff. We even get into uh, conspiracy theories. He dove deep into that. We talk about hearing aids. We're at that age where we share notes on hearing aids. <laughs> and we talk about the, uh, the long life grind, the grind of uh, the entertainment business. It was great to have him on. This guy is uh, a good friend. And if you have not heard the original episode when I had him on years ago, go back and check that out because it's, uh, it's also a very cool episode. I want to tell you guys uh, thank you for uh, the support. I mean it. Over the years, it's just been incredible. This is the 13th year. Oh, wait. What year is this? I can't remember. I think it's the 13th year of the podcast. I'm kind of sidetracked right now because my dog is going cuckoo under the blankets here trying to uh, hide herself from the cold air coming in. It's cold here in L.A. It's a, it's a chilly, chilly 50 degrees. Yep, yep. We are pussies out here in uh, California. You pussies. Yeah, that's what we are. Anyway. I love you guys. Thank you. Enjoy the episode. JJ, thank you for doing the show. And uh, yeah, man, the candles are lit. See you out on the road this week. Have a good week. Here he is, JJ French. I often wonder why uh, you didn't ever move out here um, in the peak of Twisted Sister. Well, first off, we were signed in England, right? Right. And I met my second wife in England. So, and we spent a lot of time in England, a lot. Right. So, and my daughter's half British, right? Right. So, so people wanted to know if I was moving to England, actually, because we were spending so much time over there. We came over here to do Stay Hungry, and I thought the weather was great, but I'm a walker, you know? I'm a city guy. I'm a Manhattan guy. Right. And, and if you're a walker, you can't walk around here. I mean, let me just say, Los Feliz is very different from Hollywood. Of course. Really different. You have a neighborhood here. Yeah. And when I was with my stepdaughter the other day, we walked a, 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 two miles. Great. We walked all the way around. It was nice to see all the little shops and stuff. So you can actually get a sense of neighborhood here. You don't get a sense of neighborhood. You know, no. That's why you, know. you find the neighborhoods where you can walk, like uh, you know uh, Highland Park. Echo Park, Eagle Rock, Los Feliz, Silver Lake, I guess. Silver Lake, um, Atwater Village. These are places where you can walk for sure. 
Um, so yeah, I get it. You know, spending four years in New York, becoming, uh, I think a better comedian, not because of the, they go, Oh, you're better in New York cause it's edgy. And it's like, you know, you're in, it's more because you're walking all the time and your eyes are open and you're taking in info for jokes. To- totally. Yeah. I mean, you think about this, the borough of Queens, more languages, I don't know if you know this, yeah. more languages spoken in the borough of Queens than anywhere else on the planet Earth. 157 languages are wow. spoken in Queens. And you know, the answer, some people go, why is that? And I'll tell you why that is. Because most people come to New York through JFK. Of course. And that's in Queens. Yeah. And they don't leave. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. kind of park themselves in Queens, you yeah. know, or Brooklyn, but they can't afford Brooklyn anymore. Yeah. So Queens becomes like a major stopover. So you always find such a diverse crowd of people. Also in New York uh, is one of the most interesting cities because in any other city in the world, if you don't want to see, quote, the bad side of the tracks, you can avoid it. You can just avoid it. New York City, once you're down on the street level, you're down with everybody yeah. else. Rich, poor, black, white, green, blue. Especially the subway. Matter, especially the great equalizer is the subway system. I'll tell you a funny story about the subway system about New York. Um, so, and this is absolutely true, what I'm about to tell you. So if I have to tell like a comedic story to a comedian, yeah. you'll appreciate it. So back in 1990, around 1990, a lot of homeless in New York. Oh, Dave, yeah. Dave, Dave Dinkins was the mayor, and it, was, and it was bad. Homeless people everywhere. And I live on the Upper West Side, so I'm near a place called Carmine's, which is a famous family-style Italian restaurant that serves family-style size portions, which is just humongous yeah. portions and full of garlic. Oh, yeah. There's so much garlic in their food that there's mouthwash in the bathrooms. Okay? That doesn't help. It's, how, it's so that, weird. That's how well known it is. Right. It, you reek of garlic. So Carmine's had just opened. And friends of mine were visiting me from, from New Hampshire. And they're very rural New Hampshire. And they're already freaked out about being in Manhattan. you know. And on top of it, we were going down to the bottom line because it was New Year's Eve to see Flo and Eddie during oh, yeah. their New Year's show. Right? So we eat at Karma, and I warn them. I go, listen, it's family style. All we need, there's like eight of us, just two entrees, two appetizers, done. Oh, no, can't be. So they overorder like five entrees. I mean, there's so much food. It's just, so they go, what do we do with it? I said, listen, there's homeless people everywhere. I said, well, just take the shopping bags. I said, I guarantee you, between here and 93rd Street, we'll pass 20 homeless people. We'll just give it to them. So... We walk down Broadway. There's no homeless people. I said, don't worry about it. Once we go downstairs in the subway, they'll be on the platform. Go down on the platform. No homeless people. I said, don't worry about it. We have a long train ride to get to the village. There'll be homeless people walking to the trains. Don't worry about it. Whole train ride. No homeless people. Anywhere. I'm thinking, am I like in some twilight zone? Like, what's going on? Finally get off at 14th Street. And there's a 12th Street exit on 14th Street. And we walk up the stairs, and there's this guy on the stairs. And he goes, man, you got money for food? I said, brother, this is your lucky day. And I put four bags of Carmine's food in front of him. And he goes, that's some Carmine's, right? I go, yeah. He goes, you know, there's a lot of garlic in that shit. You got some, orange, you got some money for some orange juice to cut through the garlic? <laughs> Only in New York City <laughs> do these guys know. <laughs> Critiquing. Man, that's too much garlic. I don't want to be blowing out my bros. <laughs> you got some money for orange juice, bro? I mean, like, I got, they looked at me and said, is that for real? I said, it's no. absolutely for real. And then, then, let me tell you, about a month later, my wife at the time and I were eating in Midtown, and we had Chinese food. We had leftover Chinese food. So we're on the platform, train platform, coming uptown, and someone walks up to us and asks me for like a couple of bucks. And I said, I said, hey, man, I want to give you the food. And the guy looks at me, and he's thinking I'm a cop. And he goes, wait a minute. Have I approached you in a menacing manner? No. Have I threatened you in any way? Uh, no. Are you, by your own volition, handing me a bag of food without any pre- Like he's reading yeah, yeah, yeah. some legal yeah, document yeah, from yeah. Law and Order. Yeah. My, my wife's going, what the hell is that? I said, that's a guy who thinks we're cops and we're going to somehow bust him, you know, yeah. for vagrancy. He, yeah, so he took our food. <laughs> he took our food. Yeah. I, yeah New York's like a, it's just weird. But anyway, the thing about Manhattan that I love, if you don't know Manhattan, is that when you live in a neighborhood, you walk out your door and within... 
two blocks, you've got 80 restaurants and 24 hour supermarkets. And, you know, and I'm, I miss, I, I love that about yeah. New York City. I, I like them both. I like them both. You know, uh, I love New York and, and I love here. The thing I don't like about New York is. I don't like the stuff neighboring around. Like, I love Manhattan and stuff, but, like, I'm not going over to, like, you know, Boston or Jersey or Connecticut. Where here I can go to, like, Malibu, Joshua Tree, Yosemite, uh, you know, the stuff around it I love also. Where around there I'm not really doing anything around, you know what I'm saying? But you have to, also, you have to have a car here. Yeah. Yeah, you have yeah. to. You don't have to have yeah. a car. But in the Uber world, it's really changed it also, though. Other than going somewhere, but you could just Uber anywhere around town now. Before you wouldn't want to, you know, a bus would take you like four hours to get from downtown to Hollywood. Yeah, like you guys have a train, right? Where does that go? Where the hell does a train? Where do you get a train? Is it underground, like a subway? Yeah, you train? can get on a train now <laughs> from here and go straight to uh, the Staples Center, which is cool. All right. Yeah, man, just avoid like everything. Within like a couple blocks from here, you can get on. Yeah, a train. yeah, like uh, you know, Vermont, like right. right Right up the street. You no know? kidding. I yeah. Just like a subway. Yeah. Okay. And they're building, they've been for like the last five years and maybe the next 10 years, they're building like subways all over down uh, like Wilshire and shit. It's going to be all over the place. You know, they used to have a full train system from Santa Monica out here and then the automobile industry got destroyed it. In like, I don't know, the 40s or something. Get rid of that, man. Let's get people oh, they in cars. Oh, they got rid of it. Oh, yeah. Well, it's all underground still. Oh, and then okay. I think uh, I think there's some kind of Elon Tesla underground tunnels or something they've been talking about. I don't know. Conspiracy people. But whatever. There was a, an incredible um, uh, transit system here before uh, like the 60s, you know? So when you lived in New York, yeah, how much time did you spend in the Bronx of all the five boroughs? Any time at all? Yeah, you know, not as much as like Brooklyn and Manhattan. Right. You know? so, so if you think about it, right? Yeah. The Bronx gets like a bad rap in movies. You know, I like, like the Bronx. Right, but it gets a bad rap. Yeah. Right? So here's the weird thing. If I said to you, there's only one borough attached to the mainland of the United States of America. Yeah. It's the Bronx. Wow. Everything else is an island. Yeah. So you got Staten Island. Yeah. You got Manhattan Island. And then you got... Queens and Brooklyn and Long Island, yeah, all attached by bridges. So what happens if they shut those bridges and tunnels down? Over, you're over. The only borough that you could get in a car and get on a road and get out is yeah. the Bronx. Yeah, and most people don't understand that there's a certain freedom to be able to get in your car and get the hell out because when 9/11 happened, you know they oh, shut man. everything down. Right, like, all the bridges and tunnels, and that was a freaky day. Yo, we have 17 bridges and tunnels that surround Manhattan. 17 bridges It's crazy. And tunnels. When you fly in and you look at it, man, it's, it's so cool to see because I love... You look at them... Like, you know, I grew up in San Francisco, so I was on the Golden Gate or the Bay Bridge pretty much like weekly, daily, whatever. And, you know, you look at those two bridges and you go, the Golden Gate is like this masterpiece of America. But when you're in New York and you look at all of these bridges... There's so many of them, and dudes were building those at some time, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, what bridge you on? Oh, I'm over there on the uh, Brooklyn Bridge. What bridge you on? The Staten Island, you know, whatever, the Staten Island yeah. Tunnel, and then I got to do this bridge. They built all that shit around yeah. the same time. Well, except the Verrazano was built way later. So the Verrazano was built in the 60s, right? okay, which, which linked... You know, the, the Italians and Staten Island call it the Guinea Gangplank. You know, that's yeah. what they call it. Like, And that's for my fans who, by the way, called it that. I'm not using that phrase. Let me just yeah. be very clear. Oh. My drummer, AJ Pirro from Staten Island, said it's called the Guinea Gangplank. Anyway, um, the Verrazano is the longest suspension bridge, I think, in the United States. I wow. think in the U.S. and it's a gorgeous bridge. And when I did, the, I ran two marathons in New York, and it starts in Staten Island. And you have to cross that bridge. But the bridges that people know, which is the George Washington Bridge, and they know the Brook, they know the Brooklyn Bridge, and they know the Williamsburg Bridge, and the Manhattan Bridge. You know, so those three bridges line up all going from you know Manhattan into Brooklyn. And but people say, how do you know which ones? Like there's three bridges, and I said just very simple to remember: BMW, like a car. Oh Brooklyn, wow! Manhattan, Williamsburg. That's how. That's how you remember the bridges as they line up 
going you know, into Brooklyn. What they don't realize is that as you get north and you get past the 59th Street Bridge, there's like every 10 blocks, there's a bridge crossing over into the Bronx. That's crazy. The 137th Street Bridge, 158th Street Bridge. Like it's just bridge after bridge after bridge after yeah. bridge after bridge. And those bridges are really interesting to try to understand because traffic in New York, as you know, traffic here sucks. And yeah. traffic in New York can be completely horrible unless it's you know. It's brutal. It's brutal. You know, I always think about, to me, you know, uh, uh, you know, New York to me is, you know, but it's really, uh, you know, Saturday Night Fever for me. That's really when I get, I think it's sixth grade or something. I'm like, oh, my God. And they do that bridge stunt yeah. where they jump off to the other level and she yeah. thinks they jumped over, you know. But, yeah, you know, uh New York's great. Like I said, I'm not one of those guys that competes. Nah, this and that. Yeah, I've, I've said it, and most people have said it. L.A. is not going, oh, we're better than them. We're not even thinking about it. It's more like New York thinks that. You know what I mean? Look, I'm, I'm comfortable in L.A. I'm yeah. comfortable in New York. I'm I love comfortable both. in London because yeah. I have to be there all the time. Yeah. And those are the centers. Those are the big centers, you know? Yeah. And people who are in those areas there kind of know it. Like my daughter once made some comment to me, like, you know, as a typical 13 year old, you know, it's so boring here in Manhattan. Like, your dad, you know, it's so boring. I look at her and I said, Manhattan is boring to you? Yeah. I said, I said, let me ask you something, sweetheart. Do you get up in the morning and say, I want to go to. Dubuque, Iowa. Do you do that? She goes, no. I said, do you get up there going, I want to go to Lincoln, Nebraska? She goes, no. I said, well, they're getting up going, I want to go to Manhattan. I so I said, if you think that this is boring, the rest of the world's going to put you to sleep because this is the most incredibly culturally rich city. And the thing is, everything is so easily accessible to New York City. You know, Central Park is, Central Park is so amazing. I'll bet you don't know the answer to this weird trivia question. Wait, is is it? Central Park on the east side of Manhattan? The west side of Manhattan or in the middle of Manhattan? Where do you think Central Park actually sits on the island? Well, the way you look at it, it's middle from f photos, you know what I mean? And then, because you can get in it from, you know, if you're at the Beacon Theater, you walk two blocks, you're in it, you know? So, so I would say it's west. Yeah, it is actually the it's on the west side of Manhattan. Yeah, that's what, Fifth Avenue. Yeah, I always which felt like that. Borders it on the east side. Yeah. is where the demarcation line flows. Yeah, down. you know it goes like right down Fifth, and the park is all the way on that side. But to New Yorkers like me, Riverside Park is amazing, and you can walk. They make the promenade now, like all the way down. Oh, I love go that. From the bridge all the way down to the South Ferry. Yeah, in fact, they're making. They're trying to finish an, a, a complete promenade surrounding Manhattan so you could actually walk the entire wow. world. And they have done whole sections on the east side. You know, when you live in the city, you take shit for granted. Like, who goes to the Empire State Building? Who goes to the Statue of Liberty? Yeah. Like, you don't do that. Yeah, right? yeah it's like me, it. Alcatraz, Golden Gate Bridge. You, you don't know? do it, right? So anyway... My wife says to me, let's do something like we've never done. I said, like, she's, there's a promenade on the east side. They just finished building it. We, we went over, and we, and, oh, my God, you're walking on the east side. And it's just, you didn't even know it was there. And they're yeah. spending millions of dollars on this stuff. I didn't go to the Empire State Building until I was 30 years old. Wow. It was the lawyer, first place I went when at, I went to at, New York. At my lawyer's office, by the way, directly across the street, no interest. Like, so I had a friend visiting from England. He said, hey, man, I want to go to the Empire. I said, you don't want to go to that shit. And I went up and I went, whoa. It's oh, it's so cool. cool. It's like me. I love Alcatraz. Like when friends would come, I'd be like, oh, yeah, let's go. <laughs> so you go to you can go to Alcatraz. So what, yeah. you go into the where the cells are? Oh, right? yeah. So you take a ferry over, which is... Which, by the way, you know, they say Alcatraz has the greatest view of San Francisco. You take the ferry over, and then you get there, and you get these headphones... And you do a full tour of the place, walking with with con ex convicts telling you stories like Lur, with sound effects and everything, like lock them up. <laughs> and you get all that sound. Then you get into the the um, solitary terry oh. confinement, and then you get to see Frank Morris and those guys two cells with the fake heads from Escape oh, from Alcatraz. That, that, yeah. that supposedly escaped, Right, correct? right, yeah. That's and there's still no controversy movie. about that. Right? Yeah, yeah, there is. It's like forever. It's, it's kind of like forever. Like, uh-oh, we got a letter from one of the guys. You know, um, 
FBI said something amazing that I kind of believe forever. The guys got out. Or let's say if they got out, they were saying. So they had to swim over to Angel Island, which is gnarly. And then basically... And the currents are supposed to be pretty bad, Oh, they're right? super gnarly, and the water's freezing cold. There's yeah. great white sharks and everything. But the point is, um, they're saying, like, you're saying these guys never did crime again. You got to steal a car. You got to rob some people to get money or whatever to start moving on. And they're like, they died, which I believe, too, because you don't just disappear for life and, you know, like, OK, I'm not that guy. Anymore. I mean, this guy, Frank Morris, had escaped every prison there was, got caught every time. So you're not like, you know, all right, I just became another guy, got a job at the CVS and, and uh, totally assimilated yep. and became a regular person. Never, never did crime again after, you know, it, it's just not possible because you need to do crime right when you get out. It's built into your genome. And yeah. what about the guy that jumped off the plane? That guy, right? Oh. With 150,000 or whatever. I mean, I love these stories. I love these conspiracy theories. Yeah, stories. yeah. You, same know, here. Conspiracy, like, you know, the Kennedy, you, you follow Ken, Kennedy oh, conspiracy Of course, stuff. of course. So, you know, like the number one Kennedy conspiracy guy is named Robert Morningstar. Yeah, yeah. Right? He's like, the, like he was always quoted. Robert Morningstar says, yeah. you know, well, the truth is Robert Morningstar lives around the corner from me. Yeah. And I was in a band with his brothers. Really? In 1964. Wow. And one of his brothers, I asked to join Twisted Sister. He's the only person to ever say no to me. Wow. In 1975, Rudy Echeverry. So Robert, Morningst Robert Morningstar's brothers, Louis and Rudy Echeverry, were in the very first band one of the second band I ever put together in my life. And Robert's the number one conspiracy guy. So the weird thing is, is that the brothers moved away years ago, but Robert stayed. And he's only a block away from my house, but I have not physically seen Robert like in a long time. And then one day I'm reading like USA Today, you know, and it says, oh, we're coming up to the, this was like the 55th anniversary right. of the Kennedy assassination. And then Robert Morningstar says, well, so it says Robert Morningstar has just said that he has proof now that two days before he was assassinated, UFOs uh, came down on a boat out in uh, Hyannisport, Massachusetts and visited Bobby and, and Rod. Like, you know, this is like wacky yeah, shit, right? of course. So no sooner do I, no sooner do I read that article. Then I walked down the 91st Street and Broadway, and there is Robert, who I had not seen in years. And I went, man, wow. Like, you're always quoted. And he goes, John, it's absolutely amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So we know that these UFOs came down. I said, Robert, here's the deal. I said, the subway's two blocks from me. I said, and you and I are going to walk towards that. And the minute I get to the stairs, I'm going down. So you can tell me everything you want up until that moment. right? Yeah. So then... The 60th anniversary comes up of the assassination. And I thought, I'd love to have him on my podcast. Yeah. So I called his brother, Louis, in Florida. I said, do you think Robert would be on my podcast? He goes, John. He goes, Robert loves you, man. Like, he'll do it in a second. I called him. And he's like right around the corner from my house. And I said, would you do the?" He said, yeah. So he did it. But I don't know if I told you this, but I dated a girl whose mother had a baby with... Fidel Castro. Did I ever tell you this? Oh, one no. Okay, so I'm dating this girl named Monica Mercedes Perez Jimenez, who, by the way, lives out here in L.A., so she doesn't mind me telling the story because the story is public knowledge. Right. And she was working at a gym that I was working out at in, like, 1988. It was one of the most beautiful women I'd ever seen. And for some stupid reason, my trainer, this kid named Angel, was getting married, and the wedding, the wedding party was going to be held in the basement of a public housing project on the Lower East Side. Huh. So I go, because I like Angel, and I'm sitting at this table, and there's Monica, who I've seen in, in, in the gym. And we start talking, you know. And, of course, it's 1988, so I'm still in the twisted world, you know, looking yeah. J.J. Frenchish, you know. And she goes, um, I see you at the gym. I said, yeah, I see you. And I said, yeah, but, you know, I'm really, the metal thing is not really my thing. My, my mother was a political consultant, and she worked with John Kennedy and Bobby King. She goes, oh. She goes, well, my mother was involved in the Kennedy assassination. Now, now this is not a kind of subject you plan to have at a wedding reception on the yeah. Lower East Side in a housing project. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So I said, pray tell, what are you talking about? So we went out on a date, and she proceeds to tell me. Her father, Monica's father, uh, Perez Jimenez was the former dictator of Venezuela, that her mother was this femme fatale, you know, gorgeous German woman who this guy fell in love with. They, you know, they had Monica and, and, a, and she had a brother. And then her mother left and went to Florida. And 
then went to Cuba, met Fidel Castro, had a kid with Fidel Castro, right? And I'm trying to take the, all this in. Yeah. Then she comes back to the United States and, and becomes a member of the CIA. And well, she's with Frank Sturgis, who's one of the Watergate burglars. Right. This is way before Watergate. Remember, Watergate's 72. We're talking 63. So she's now being given orders by Frank Sturgis. And again, I'm saying to myself, why am I so lucky to hear this whack, this crazy story, right? So she says, uh, so I say to her, Monica, you know, 25 people try to commit, try to kill Fidel Castro. It's well known after the Bay of Pigs invasion. She goes, yes, my mother was one of the 25 people. I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, Frank Sturge just found out they had a kid, told my mother that, that Castro killed the kid in order to get my mother pissed off enough to kill Fidel. She goes back to Cuba with a poison pen yeah. to kill Fidel Castro, finds out her son's alive and well, has no reason to kill Fidel, comes back to the United States, and tells Frank Sturgis, I'm not going to kill. He says, well, I have something else you need to do. On November 21st, 963, I need you to come to Dallas. She goes, why? She says, I just need you to be in Dallas. That's all. You're going to be in a car with me and some people. That's it. So she goes, okay. So she flies to Dallas on the 21st, and she's in a car. And in this car, purportedly, is Frank Sturgis, Jack Ruby, yeah. Lee Harvey Oswald <laughs> and Officer Tippett, the, the cop who was shot in the theater. Right. Now, if this is a true story, she'd be the only witness that could tie all these characters right. together, right? So um, I said, so what happened? She said they drove around Dallas on the 21st, and then in the morning of the 22nd, she flew back to Miami. When she landed in Miami, she found out Kennedy was killed. She said to herself... I know that all these people I was with are involved because for some reason they wanted a woman in the car to take away the some they just like divert attention to the vehicle. So I I, I so I said to Monica, I said, Your mother I said, Your father was the was the dictator of Venezuela. Your mother had an affair with Fidel. Then was in Dallas with Lee Harvey Oswald, was a member of the CIA, and she says, Yeah, and I said she goes, it gets even weirder, John. I said, how much weirder? She goes, she goes, in 1975, I was arrested for the attempted murder of Frank Sturgis. I said, excuse me? She says, yeah. In 1975, I was 15 years old, and the Watergate, there was a Watergate hearings in Washington, and my mother was going to testify. She was going to testify that she was in a car, like she was going to actually finally testify. Right. And she said that Frank Sturgis called the house, and Monica overheard the conversation. Frank Sturgis said, I will kill you if you testify. So Monica, at the age of 15, buys a gun on the street and waits for Frank Sturgis to come to their tenement in Manhattan. And when the guy comes to the building that looks like Frank Sturgis, she shoots him. And she's arrested for attempted murder. Now, I said to Monica, this is crazy. He goes, John, do you want to meet my mom? I go, sure. So she says, okay. She's living in a tenement in Queens. So... We go to, Queen, go to Queens, we go to Northern Boulevard in Queens. We stop at a bodega. She says, uh, get a six pack of beer and a straw. I go, why? She goes, my mother likes to drink beer and a straw, with a straw. So I buy a six pack of beer, bring a straw, walk into this apartment, and wall to wall is all the news stories, magazine stories, like something out of one of those crime movies when you walk into like some obsessed person's house and yeah. they've got photos of everything up, you know, that they've ever done and stuff like, like serial like, killers, like serial killer type <clears throat> shit. And there is a copy of the Daily News, front page: Monica Mercedes arrested for the attempted murder of Frank Sturgis. I'm like, I said, so what happened? She said, well, the guy I shot at wasn't Frank Sturgis. I thought it was, but I, luckily I missed him. Wow. And when the police arrested me for attempted murder and they realized I didn't hit the guy and heard the story, I kind of was, they lowered the charge down to something else and that was the end of that. So I said, Monica, this is the most amazing story ever. So she said, yeah, we're trying to, trying to make a, a movie about my mom's life. And I said, well, you should. Remember, this is 1988, right? So I'm, I lose track of Monica, 1989. Uh, I get a call from her, and she says, come visit me, I'm in a hospital about to have an operation, and I want to see you before I have an operation. So I go to this hospital on the Upper East Side, and uh, Monica's in the hospital room with her mom, who I'd met that one time in the tenement, and I said to Monica, how are you doing? She goes, I'm not doing well, I have to have this really important operation, some female trouble, blah, blah, blah. I said, okay. Her mother takes me outside, puts her arm around me, and says, when you go back inside, 
and you say goodbye to Monica, you're saying goodbye to Monica, you'll never see her again. And I said, why? She goes, well, in order to pay for the operation, I had to give her to the, uh, to the CIA. I had to sell her to the CIA for 10 years. So I, I went, you know what? I, I walked in the room. I said to Monica, uh, you know, I hope you get better. And that's that. And then that's it, right? And that was 1989. Freaky story. Time goes on. About 10 years ago, I'm telling this story to my tour manager. My tour manager is one of these guys, you gotta find her, you gotta find, this is an amazing story. He's like, like, to him, it's an incredible story. I said, I don't really have any interest. He look, goes online and he finds Monica Mercedes Perez Jimenez lives in Los Angeles and uh, she has an email address and it's dictatorsdaughter.com, right? <laughs> so I email her yeah. and it's Monica and she's living out here and she says, yeah, next time you come out, you got to come visit me. So I, when my wife and I came out last year, I said to my wife, you want to meet her? Because I, I you know, wasn't getting like any weirdness. I just said, hey, like, here's the story. Right. How would you like to meet this person? This is like a crazy story. She goes, yeah. So she came to the hotel and she hung out with us for the afternoon and told us the whole story. How crazy. Now, here's the, wait, let me just tie it all. So Robert Morningstar, right? Yeah. So now I'm telling this to Robert Morningstar. He's on my show and he goes, you know Monica Mercedes Perez Jimenez? You dated her? This is the missing piece of his Kennedy right. conspiracy yeah, yeah, of course. story. So I hooked them both up and had them both on my podcast. Two and loonies. The, and they were on each other's podcast. Two yeah. loonies. Wow. It's just, you know, there's no shortage of crazy, man. No, there's not. None. No. Hey, last night you were showing me, uh, we can talk a little bit about your special. Yeah, up. sure. You're the so you're only one me, that's seen it. You're showing me ex ex excerpts that's fucking funny, looks amazing, it's great. You know, watching you perform is, is a, a treat. Knowing how long you've done it is a treat. So I have questions for you. Like, I keep yeah. thinking about you as a, as a performer. What is the... What, how old were you when you did first stand-up routine? 44. And how old are you now? 58. Okay, so what does the 58-year-old tell the 44-year-old now that he didn't know back when he started? You know, I, fuck, I don't, that's a good question. I, I really don't... There's not any things where I'd be like, I'll do this different or whatever, because it happens so organically. And so uh, slowly over a period of time. Oh, God. Yeah, dude. I mean, look, you know, 5,900 spots now. Um, you know, it's uh, like I said, when I started, I just went, you know, I'd done a movie with uh, an Ice Cube movie, and Garrett Morris from SNL was in the movie. And this Michael Collier, a funny comedian in Earthquake. So when I was doing the movie, I said, I want to do comedy. They're laughing at me. And then I started. I told it to you on your podcast. I had no idea. Like you said, how do you know how many spots you did? I just thought I was going to go down and do it. You know, like, I'm going to go try that. I always wanted to try it. No regrets when you die. And uh, I had no idea that it would be, f you know, 15 years later. And I would, you know, play the venues I didn't get to as a musician. Madison Square Garden, Hollywood Bowl, um, you know, uh, the L.A. Forum, Oakland Arena, uh, you know, that, the cave where I did the special, all of that. So it's just, you know, if I was 58 and I looked at somebody at 44, if I'm giving somebody my age a tip... I would just be like, uh, hey, man, make sure you love this because you can make a lot of money doing something with the amount of hours you're going to have to put in. And there's not any guarantee you're going to get anything. But with me, it was happiness of like, oh, my God, I'm doing something I've always wanted to do. Did you get a paycheck the first time you did it? Fuck no. no. Now, how long was it before you got your first pay? Long time, man. You know? Uh, well, six months in, a guy said, hey, you got 20 minutes, right? And I was like, oh, yeah. I didn't have 20 minutes. He goes, cool. You're going to feature for me at this NASCAR corporate gig in Arizona. I go, oh, cool. And I think I got, you know, $400 or something. Um, was that your first paycheck? Yeah. Do you remember thinking how cool this was that you got paid for it? Well, I never wanted to tell anybody that I would have done this for free. Anyway, you never want to say that, but inside you're going like, I just want to do comedy. You know, now you look at it and you go like, well, I'm not 
going over there unless it's some good amount of money because, uh, you know, it's a lot of work. If it's a bad gig, it could throw you back five steps, you know, like, oh, God, that was an awful gig. And, you know, awful gigs still affect you deep in. You know? Do they traumatize you and make you not want to go back out on the No, screen? they don't do that. It's just more like it just sits with you. And I think it's because I care. Anybody that cares about what they're doing, you're like, fuck, it went wrong. People that don't care or are delusional, I've seen them bomb and they come off and they go, that was pretty good, huh? And I'm like, what? I would fucking run out of here if I had a set like that. Let me ask you this then. So t- I've always been under this... In my head, yeah, I, I developed this this kind of like really basic overarching theory. There's four stages of performance. There's you suck and the audience sucks. You suck and the audience is great and you're just so grateful that you got away with it. Yeah, you're great and the audience sucks and you're really questioning why you're doing it. And you're great and the audience is great. And those are you strive for all the time. Right. How? What was it like the first time you did a set where you thought you killed it and it didn't go over? Did you? Do you have any recollection of that? You mean where I thought I? Yeah, when ki- you thought you you killed, but it didn't. Or or if the audience doesn't think you killed, you don't think you killed. Just how does? You know how did? Did you ever process that where you said, man, I don't know what happened. Like, I thought, th- I thought I was doing so good, and it didn't work. Well, I record every set, and anytime you go like, what the fuck was that, you know? You listen to it the next day, and you go, oh, I know what it was. I was going too fast. I came on too mean. I told the joke wrong. Sometimes you'll be like, this joke kills all the time. And then you listen, and you go, oh, I didn't even do the fucking setup right. You, d- you, you did it wrong or whatever. So... It's always something, and I think that that uh, lets you know that you're alive. I often say, like, I probably bomb, like, once every six weeks, and it's really uh, some kind of, like, uh, a message from the the gods of, like, hey, man, sit down for a minute and figure out what you're doing. You might have done 10 podcasts that week, and you weren't fully engaged, or... uh, you know, you're doing too much new shit or it, there's something always, you know. Do you, do you how, how do you prepare when you go on stage? You kind of like go, I got this. Or you give yourself a minute to get your head together. Like what, how do you, how do you get your thoughts together to, to deliver it? I just kind of right before I go on, I kind of look over notes and then I'm ready to go. You know, because I, I don't really like to prepare too much because I like the organicness of it. I like to go on and go, what the fuck is it? I don't even watch the room until I go on. Some people sit in the room. They want to know what's going on. I don't want to know what's going on. I don't want to prejudge the room. I want to walk on, open my eyes and go, oh, wow, what the fuck is this? Or, you know. So there's no fear there from you. Which no. Is, but was it always no fear? Well, I would played music 25 years, so I've been on stage. Right. This is my 40th year on stage. I like to right. tell people that because they're just kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, 40 years. So, of course, it's totally different doing comedy. But, but you're still on stage doing a gig. Yeah, you know it's scary I mean? as it's fuck a- when you first start out. Holy shit, for like five years, you're just like, I mean, the comedy store OR was considered the scariest, hardest room in America. And you're watching these superstars just slay in there, and you know how hard it is. It's not as hard anymore. I don't know if the e- audience is a little easier now because they love the comedy store, or I've just gotten better. I, I really don't know because I don't watch other guys go on. Um, but I remember each time I go on to the comedy store, I go, oh my God, the OR. 15 minutes, here we go. You know what was it like the first heckler you got? Do you remember what that was like, or how do you? Yeah, I remember it was the first show. Oh, uh, sorry, the second show. The first show I did was at the uh, Hollywood Improv, and I killed. But a lot of people kill on their first time because they're like, it, you know, they're it's their friends are there and their friends are laughing. Like I can't believe he's up there, whatever. Right. Second show, I had no idea. The second show was in the belly room at the Comedy Store, and I was in the back. And I had killed uh, three nights before. So I studied the recording. Breath, word for word, timing, when I took a breath, everything. I mean, I studied it like this is how I kill. And you watched other comedians, right? You had to. 
yeah. develop this of course. style, right? Okay, so. You have no style when you start. It's just okay. kind of like what you've seen. You've seen prior, maybe you love prior, okay. maybe you love, you know. So you're what hoping I mean? that the things you've picked up are going to translate into right. your, your thing. So second show, I go on, and uh, I had this bit where I go, man, dreams are weird, right? Like last night I had a dream I was sucking my buddy's dick. Gross. Nothing, right? I mean nothing. And I kind of look around because I wasn't looking around and I noticed it's, it's an all men, man crowd, all dudes. And I hear a guy go, what's so gross about that? And then another guy goes, yeah. And I go, oh, this is a gay show. And I proceeded to bomb for the next eight minutes. Awful. And I had friends there, right? And you know when you bomb really bad, they don't even mention the set. They're like, hey, you want to go get something to eat? They don't say shit. Now, I would have been able to get out of that in one second. I would have been, you know, what's so gross about that? I'd be like, well, it was a fucking white dick. <laughs> and I love Asian dick. Any kind of fucking thing, you could have just bam right. and been out of that. But, you know. And it was a shitty bit anyway, you know what I mean? It's just shitty bits get exposed early on, and you keep writing. You know, our, our first gig as Twisted was in full transvestite clothing. Up until then, it was always jamming with the Allman Brothers type bands, you know, like right. you're on stage in t-shirts, jeans, and you're playing. Now, like, we're in full, like, you know, we're in full. And it was a Tuesday night at the Satellite Lounge, in uh, Cookstown, New Jersey, which was a converted bowling alley next to the Fort Dix Army Base. Yeah. And it was a gigantic room. I mean, 70s? 1973. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was March of 73. Right? right. So it was a massive room. And, you know, in those days, the club owners were like all like mob related. Of course. Guys, and they were also transitioning out of another another era of the music industry where they had like you know crooners and yeah, yeah. doo-wop bands and you know they were being dragged against their will into the rock world because they had to change of course right? so this guy carlo had no interest in being nice to us and you could tell he hated it but the thing is it was five shows that night and it was a uh, we went on at 9, 10, 11, 12, and 1. So it was 9 to 9, 40, 10 to 10, 40, 12, right? And 1, 40 we ended. And there was maybe 20 people in the room. And I, and I, and I was chained to my, my bass player and I had dog collars and we were chained together, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, so we played the five sets. I don't think we had enough material for five sets. I think we did the first three sets and then we played, we played the first two sets. We get through the night and I'm like, okay. You know, I'm dressed in like a purple halter top and a dress and fucking purple boots and i don't know what the fuck anyway uh and uh but you know this was the height of bowie and lou reed and Mata Hoople and slade and sweet right so we know that we're protected by the hipness of it but there's nobody in the room that's a, it's just a, like 20 people in this gigantic fucking room so next night wednesday night same thing go on stage 20 people in the room you know felt a little better you know we were feeling our way through the set you know we did it in those days we did bowie songs mott songs lou reed songs i mean in fact i was a lou reed guy i sang the lou reed songs because when i joined twisted they said to me you know they all sang they said do you sing and i said not really and they said good you can do the lou <laughs> reed hilarious song, okay? yeah yeah so so i'm doing like walk on the wild side and you yeah know, like whatever. talking i'm talking of yeah. course because you know anyone like, how do you fuck up a lou reed so you can't fuck it you up can't. sing it on key maybe i don't yeah, know yeah yeah so uh, so we're doing that. Then Thursday night comes, same thing, 20 people. And by the, I said, wow, okay, all right. I guess, you know, there's 20 people dancing, you know, whatever. Well, Friday night comes, and we get the schedule. First of all, we're opening for Little Anthony and the Imperials. Oh, shit. All right. Yeah. So now, I, I, so the drummer says to me, yeah, he goes, our first set is at 10 to 10.40, and then 11 to 11.40. And then Little Anthony's going to come on at midnight, and they're going to do two hours. And then our next sets are 2 to 2.40, 3 to 3.40, and 4 to 4.40. Oh, okay? fuck. And there's 3,000 GIs out there who had just got their money. Oh. Had just gotten paid on Friday. Yeah, night. and they want to get all their money at the bar. So Drink all night. I open up the curtain, and I'm dressed the way I'm dressed and there's 3,000 and I throw up. Oh. I said to myself, we are going to get fucked 
freaking killed. And you know, I have to say, it was interesting. Most of the soldiers there, I mean, it's New Jersey. Um, they were like into Bowie and Lou Reed and shit like that. Yeah. So they kind of like, you know, yeah. they thought it was kind of cool. That's like, the it, classic mistake they, when you judge the crowd. Yeah, totally like classic. They, they embraced it. The band was good. They embraced it. We played, you know, our sets. And then Lynn Anthony did his shtick, right? And then yeah. we cleaned up and, you know, got back to the hotel at six o'clock in the fucking morning. And that, and that was, that's how those things were. Then uh, we played a place called the Rec Room in Philadelphia the next night. And then this, two weeks later, we're back at the Satellite Lounge. And uh, this time, who's the featured show band? The Coasters are the featured wow. show band. So this is like how weird... What a juxtapose. A juxtaposition is weird. Yeah. So we did that. We cleared that hurdle. And then we started playing. In those days, you played one room for an entire week. You showed up in the room. Of course. You set your gig up. And you played Tuesday through Sunday. That's how the gigs were. And, you know, we were making 150 a night. But look, gasoline was 23 cents a gallon. Yeah. Rent House was like was 150 bucks, bucks a month. Yeah. You could do it. Totally. You could actually make money. Yeah, you could because the cost of everything was so low. The hotel we we're all staying in one room at a at a red roof inn at nineteen dollars and ninety five cents a oh night. Oh my god! All in one all room. All in one room, like on two mattresses on the floor. Shit, I would never do now. You know? So no, but we're, tw we're like nineteen. <laughs> I get years it. Old, I've done it. Old, right? I've done vans. I've so done hotels. That. I've done you know people's houses, the garage. Yeah. So that was like you know that was like trial by fire, and then a club owner from Long Island comes down and says, you know, I'm looking for a house band for the Mad Hatter and the Hamptons, and if, and I'm looking at a bunch of bands, and he comes to see us in uh, New Jersey at a place called the Colony 3 in Nutley, New Jersey. And he says, you know, I really like you guys. I want to hire you, but it's in the Hamptons, and it's 15 solid weeks in a row. It's 105 nights from Memorial Day to Labor Day weekend. And, uh, and he goes, I don't know how these kids are going to adapt to your thing, because they're all Irish and Italian kids from, from Queens. And he goes, I'm going to do a test weekend to see how it goes. So he brings us out the week before Memorial Day, and, uh, and he loves it. They love it, and they hired us. And we worked 105 nights from Memorial Day to Labor Day in the summer of 73. And so that was a trial by fire, right? So we get through that, okay. But the club that you want to get into in New Jersey was Dodds. That was the, that was the club, the highest paying club, and that was the club we really wanted to play in. So we finally, our agent says, I got you into Dodds. You're only getting paid 300 bucks for the night, but here's the thing, you're playing with a chimpanzee. Oh. And I go, <laughs> what do you mean? He says, yeah, well, his name is Mr. Jiggs, and you're going to be on a bill with a, a chimp. And I said, well, okay. So the chimp goes on before us. He goes, well, actually, no. The chimp is the headliner. Wow. You're opening for the fucking chimp. Wow. Okay. So Spinal tap, too. Uh, spinal tap. Dude, we did the gig. We went over okay. The chimp went over fucking great. Now, ask me, what the hell does Mr. Jiggs do? Number one, you can find him on YouTube. Yeah. Right? So Mr. Jiggs wore a tuxedo, and the club had a bar that had like a three-foot wide bar that ran the entire circumference of the club. So Mr. Jiggs basically rolled a rolling cart of alcohol and cigarettes around the bar and mixed drinks for people and lit cigarettes for girls. Wow. That was, his, that was the gig. That was his whole gig. And he went over great. And then many years later, I was with a promoter, John Sher. I don't know if you know him. He was a famous promoter, promoted the Grateful Dead. And I was saying, he said, what's the most humiliating gig you ever did? I said, well, we fucking played with a chimp. Mr. Jiggs, he goes, I used to book Mr. Jiggs at the Capitol Theater in Passaic. Oh. In fact, I had Fleetwood Mac on with Mr. Jiggs. And I, I felt better. <laughs> Fleetwood Mac. And I yeah. said, well, did Mr. Jiggs open or did Fleetwood Mac open? He goes, well, Fleetwood Mac headlined, of course. I said, well, that's the difference, dude. Oh, my God. <laughs> we opened for the chimps. So when you go through trials by fire with kind of shit like that and you say to yourself, you know, no band's ever going to see that kind of world again. No. It doesn't exist anymore. No, no. I don't know how, but you see in the comedy world, you have a million tiny comedy clubs, right? So you can still learn from the grassroots. Of course. There's no place, I think, for young bands to learn from anymore. Well, I, you know, I've been, this is 700 and, I don't know, 77 episodes now, and I've interviewed so many bands, and I really don't know how you even do it. I mean, it's just, there's just zero money. 
which is insane. Zero money, you know. So I really don't. I really don't understand it. Now I've been out on tour with some people that do pop off. Marcus King, I think you have to be this fucking shiny diamond, the real deal, and then it starts to happen. Um, but in order to be seen, even to, for the real deal to be seen as a grind, you how know? was Marcus? Was Marcus seen on YouTube? Was that how he got his? Is that what lit the fire for that guy? No, career? you know. Um, By the way, Warren I just Haynes. want to say this: that yeah. that Dean played for me, Marcus King, yesterday, and I'm a blues guitar fanatic, so you would think I would have known this guy. And right. I'd heard his name, I'd seen him on magazine covers, never heard him. And when you were talking to me about him, he's a really good singer player. I'm going, yeah, yeah, okay, how good is he? Oh my God! Yeah, he is transcendent. Unbelievable. Blew my mind. Okay, yeah. so go ahead. So what do you what do you think? I think it was Warren Haynes discovered him, you know, when he was a kid. Uh he was playing around North Carolina and uh Warren signed him and took him on the road or whatever, and you know, and you're being in that Almond Brothers world. Immediately uh you see somebody like Marcus King at 16, 17, and it, it's just like the all the the Almond Brothers kids, they're all fucking great. And then the audience loves great music. So it's, it's, a, it's a slam dunk. You're in front of the audience that's going to love you as long as you deliver, and they deliver, you know? Yeah, well, it helps, too. Where's he from originally? What, I think it's born? North Carolina. Yeah, those Southern guys, man, they know how to do it. Ah, you know, they real really, deal. They really know how to do it. You know, in New York City, you can walk into a club on Bleecker Street, and I, my friends play on these places. And you know, on any given night, you see like mediocre musicians, but they got all their drunk friends there, and the club owner doesn't give a shit because it's packed, right? Of course. Doesn't care less. Right? It's packed. Everything's great. Not great musicians. But you go down to Nashville, every goddamn oh, yeah. location's got a guy that plays like Brad Paisley. Oh, yeah. Fucking it's crazy. 18 year old kids, 16 year old kids are playing telecasters like Blair. I, I, it, the mind is blown. And I have a theory about that. I really think that the church cultivates great musicians i mean if you come to the church and you suck you're out like yeah. you're, they don't tolerate they just don't tolerate bad musicians yeah, you know yeah, what i yeah. mean you have to sing like aretha franklin you got to sing like otis redding and you got to play like brad paisley I mean, those players are absolutely fabulous and nashville is full of players yeah like that. yeah man uh you know i don't know it's uh i'm glad i do comedy now 100 percent. you know did you ever think of incorporating any of that music into your set no. never completely i never cross pollinate the two i got it i don't like comedy rock when i played music i loved comedy um i would never do both it's just not my thing yeah you know what i mean i think it's like i love the pure comedy of like the the greats you know what i mean and um i played music so i have no fantasy of being like you know a musician a lot of comics want to be musicians a lot of musicians want to be comics so i already played music so i'm not up there like oh man i wish i was a rocker instead absolutely not you're right athletes want to be rock stars rock right. stars want to be athletes totally. i remember uh, we're going to talk about 40th anniversary of stay hungry when when stay hungry came out in may of 1980 of, of 84 i was flying to la for the debut party that was going to be at maurice's snack and chat somewhere yeah. in downtown la and i was sitting next to a guy who actually was a world-class 110 meter hurdler like and i was in that i was still running marathons in those days so i recognized him from a magazine article and i started to ask him questions about you know what's it like to do the racing circuit around the world and when he realized who i was he said man who wants to fucking talk about that shit he goes what's it like to be you yeah, and do your thing and i said oh what the fuck i said that's what i do all the time i'm not it's boring as hell to me he goes boring as hell i said what's it like for you he goes oh man you know it's boring as hell to me like you it, you have this different way of approaching of what you do obviously the guy was at the top of his game he was great at what he did he invited me to several games i, I saw him perform and he was he was amazing um but to think that this is 40 years later um stay hungry i there was no way of knowing in 1984 that the songs we're not going to take it and i want to rock would be forever part of the the song cycle of 1984 not only that but it's in more commercials tv commercials more movies more soundtracks i mean 
It's just everywhere, and it continues to to get licensed every year. And yeah. I keep thinking every year, is someone going to get sick of it? No, they don't. These songs resonate. So when people say, oh, well, yeah, but you got Kiss and ACD, I said, I'm sorry. They're licensed more than any of those. In fact, the only band that I know of that has the same kind of two songs that are everywhere all the time. Or Queen, Well, no, Queen, because we are the champions right. and we will rock you, are in every baseball stadium, every hockey arena. You know, they're everywhere, right? You always hear those two songs. And those are the two, and those two songs come out at the same time. And Queen's the beneficiary. Not to say, by the way, that they don't have incredible songs. Like, don't get me wrong here. Yeah. Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody, my God, is one of the greatest. It's the national anthem of heavy rock. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And of course, ACDC is absolutely amazing. Of course. So, but there was no way of knowing that we're not going to take it and I want to rock, we're going to be what they were. And so, three nights ago, I was at the 80th birthday party of music uh, legend Phil Carson, who signed Twisted Sister. And at that party, were J Jeff Pilson was there. Do you know Jeff? Yeah, yeah. Pilson sang vocals on We're Not Going to Take It. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Pilson, Mick Brown, and Don Dockin did background vocals, and according to D, according to D, Mr. Mister. Mr. Mister, the band, yeah. They sang background vocals, too. So it was a, a big amount of guys in there like gang vocal. I think they were gang vocal, but you know what? Back in those days, you know, you made your album in pieces. So yeah, the bass and drums do it, and then they go. Of course. Three days, and then they go home. Like, they don't need to be around, right? Then the guitar parts come in, and you do you that. And if you and if you and if you sing, you put your vocal on, then you go home, and then it leaves with the lead singer who needs X amount of days to do his vocals. Like that's how disconnected you are from the whole experience. So I wasn't around ninety percent of the recording. Once my guitar parts were done, yeah. I, I went back to New York City. You know, and that was, was that Tom Warman did that. That was Warman. Yeah. Oh wow, wow. Yeah. You know, the song "Stay Hungry" to me <clears throat> is uh, you know I grew up in the eighties music, and a lot of it I just can't listen to as I got older, it's just kind of like, whoo, man. But that song, Stay Hungry, is really, uh, it's a giant theme uh, and inspiring tune to me. The actual lyrics and then seeing the documentary of Twisted Sister, I look at it and go, that's happened to me over and over and over in my life, you know? I've never been the industry darling. I'm not the super good looking guy. Uh, I'm always grinding. And that Stay Hungry song, when I fucking hear it, like I'll be cruising and it'll come on the radio, like on Boneyard, and I'll just turn that shit up, man. He's a great lyricist. Yeah. You know, and he wrote from the heart. Yeah. He always felt disenfranchised, the ugly kid, the guy who never got the girl. Yeah. Everyone always told us we were terrible, we're never going to make it, and he and it made him harder. And he wrote these lyrics, and, and I have to be honest, I don't, I don't pay attention to lyrics in general. I'm not a lyric guy, I'm a more of a melody guy. And almost every song, or when people say to me, or oh, you've heard this a million times, maybe about an artist. Someone will say, oh man, his lyrics got me through. Their lyrics got me through some right. really bad times. Or I get letters, heartfelt letters from fans. I was going through this tough time. And I, and I go, I've never done that. Like I've never had a song lyric rela relate to me to get me through a trouble times. But having, you know, having said that, um, one day somebody says to me in my elevator, in my buildings. And, oh, by the way, you know, there was a rabbi who, was, uh, who uh, became a rabbi in Brooklyn and he used a Twisted Sister song during his, his indoctrination or whatever. And uh, you should look it up on, on, uh, online. I went, a rabbi used a, t a Twisted Sister song? Okay. Weird. Weird. I didn't think much of it. And people kept saying to me, yeah, it's this rabbi, man. Yeah, so. So uh, I thought, wow, that's kind of weird. And then, father well my soon to be father-in-law my, now my, my current wife Sharon but her dad got pancreatic cancer and, and died 11 days after his diagnosis like, wow done right so we needed a rabbi to to um, officiate the you know his eulogy and all that stuff and um, we're trying to figure out and it just at that moment at that particular time at that right after he passed away and my wife was trying to argue with her mother as to who we're going to get, what rabbi we're going to get. Her mother lives in, in Arizona. We're living in New York City. Um, uh, I, get a, I get a phone call from um, my uh, Sharon's uh, sister's husband who says, oh, by the way, um, I sent you a video. You should check it out. So I 
open up my computer and there's the rabbi being, you know, inducted, you know, becoming a rabbi to, of, of all songs, Tear It Loose from our first album. Wow. And his name is Darby Lee. And I'm thinking, Darby Lee doesn't sound like a rabbi. Uh, Shlomo Abramovich sounds like a rabbi. Darby Lee sounds like a porn star. Right, right. right. So the guy, so uh, like I'm thinking, well, that's, that, that's really weird. And, and, and I contact this person and we have lunch. And I thought, and I, I thought it was a blind woman. I thought Darby Lee was a blind woman rabbi. Right. In walks a deaf guy named Darby Lee, tattoos from the neck all down his body with dreads out the back, and uh, and he's speaking. You know how like some deaf people have that you can tell they're deaf by the way they yeah yeah they have perfect diction, weird cochlear implants. And I said, I'm so sorry. I thought you were a woman, Darby. I thought you were blind, not deaf. I'm sorry. What's up with the, with um, using, you know, tear it loose? Like, how random? And how come you're a heavy metal fan? Like, how's it even more random? And he goes, well, when I was like eight years old, my brother took me to a Twisted Sister when you guys played the Felt Form. And he goes, for the first time ever, I heard the bass come through my body. Wow. I fell in love with heavy metal. Wow. And then he got cochlear implants, so you can kind of hear a little bit, right? So he's a huge metal fan. So I went, I said, wow. I said, listen, man, um, you know, this is going to be weird, but like on Saturday, my, uh, my, uh, my wife's um, father's uh, going to have a service at, this, at the synagogue right near us, and I don't know if we have a rabbi, but would you be interested in officiating if we can't find one? And he goes, it would be my pleasure. So I go home, and I say to Sharon, I said, I met with the blind, I thought it was a blind woman, who's a deaf guy who likes heavy metal. I mean, there's like a joke in there somewhere, right? right? Yeah. And I said, I said, I asked this person if this person wants to be the rabbi officiating, and my wife goes, my mother would never allow a deaf, heavy metal rabbi in a million years to officiate over her, her husband's. I said, okay, I just asked, listen, you know, don't shoot the messenger. I just was looking for a backup plan. About an hour after that conversation, I get a phone call from her brother-in-law, Jay, who says, what would you think of that video? I said, I had I said, do you know I had lunch with that person? I said, why? Why did you send me that? And he goes, that's our rabbi. Oh, he's wow. our rabbi in New Jersey. In fact, he's the rabbi that's going to look after our daughter's bat mitzvah. I went, you're kidding me. So I told Sharon. I said, my, Sharon said, their rabbi is the guy you had lunch with who was deaf? That's it. I'm making an executive decision. So he wound up being wow. the rabbi who officiated over the uh, over my father-in-law's uh, service. And, uh, and it was really crazy. So anyway, I write D. I said, dude, I had lunch with a, <laughs> with a deaf heavy metal rabbi who used Tear It Loose as his song. I said, can I ask you a question? Why would this person use Tear It Loose? So D writes me, he goes, dude, do you ever listen to the lyrics? And he goes, it's about empowering people. Because he always writes very positive songs about overcoming problems and challenges. And, and he writes the whole thing out and he goes, I am so glad somebody pays attention to my lyrics. And that's the kind of way that D writes. So you know what, if from an authentic standpoint, that's how it works. And I think that that's, I think I want to rock and we're not going to take it have lasted all this time because of that because they're just everywhere and it's amazing to me this the album has now sold eight million copies i think worldwide which is you know which is a great number um multi-platinum in many many countries which has been extraordinary and frankly the high point of the band's career so oh yeah you know, totally so after that it was come out and play which didn't immediate well. bomb yeah it yeah just you know it didn't work man yeah that was a bummer you know, yeah. the cover was cool, Mark Weiss. Or, or, it, it was a great cover and it was a great concept. Our problem with that, that album that, was that it was the wrong single. Had yeah, we released that Fire, was the Still, worst. Fire Still Burns would have been yeah. a great single. Would have, and we should have not done it with makeup. It should have just come out with T-shirts and jeans. Yeah. And we went, you know, and that, we were a victim of what I call the goofball era of MTV rock. Right. Where it became too cartoony. Right. Everything was cartoony. Devo's cartoony. You know, like the bangos were cartoony. Um, B-52s were cartoony. Yep. When you're cartoony, it's like a lot of sugar. In a, in a, it tastes good for the first 20 minutes, and then it doesn't have staying power. Yeah. That was the problem with us. We just didn't have... Uh, although, the pro, oh, the tr but as you know with the documentary, there was so much more beneath the surface for the band to be successful. But yet, the public just saw that surface. You know how I knew things were really going south for us? You know how I kind of knew? Yeah. We're in the middle of the St. Hungry Tour. We're in Philadelphia. 
we're at the peak of the Stay Hungry. Like it's in the summer of 84. Song is fucking everywhere. Video everywhere, like crazy. And we're playing at the Spectrum in Philly across from Veterans Stadium. So the Mets are playing the Philadelphia Phillies, right? So I figured I'm on off day. I'll put my hat on, hair back up. I'll go watch the Mets play. Why not? I'm, I'm famous. I'm not bad. So I go over to Veterans Stadium, and I'm sitting in my seat about to watch the game. And <laughs> brother, two brothers walking up the stairs, like a 17-year-old kid and his 8-year-old brother. And they have like hot dogs, right? And they're walking up the stairs, and the kid's going, we're not going to take it. And his brother goes, will you shut the fuck up? I'm so sick of that song. And I'm like, oh. uh-oh. It's the canary <laughs> in the coal mine, man. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's, what are the odds of that? What are the odds of that? It's kind of scary, man. I mean, now we look at it 40 years later, and I have to say it's in a hell of a, hell of a history. Anything for the re-release, like demos? And yeah, yeah, well, what's on the re-release is the original album's been remastered, and we added two songs that were recorded for the album but never made the album. They were released on independent projects that were never tied in to Stay Hungry, so this time we actually put it on the record. So if you're familiar with the record, you get two tracks that you... I mean, think about an album that you know, and all of a sudden you put it on, and there's songs that oh, yeah. you didn't know, and you go, wow... How cool is that? They were they were done for those sessions, right? So we we basically started recording them. Here's what happened: the reason why those songs were not finished for the record was because Worman told us to take songs off. He said you have too many songs and you have to sacrifice some, and he didn't really care about we're not going to take it. I want to rock, frankly. Whoa! He didn't really care about whether they were going to be on the record or not. But he said you got to sacrifice two. So we sacrificed "Never Say Never" and "Blast and Fast and Loud," and they kind of sat on a shelf unfinished. We eventually got the tapes. We finished them up. We put them on. So that's, that's a double vinyl. Well, okay. So vinyl one is the album with the two bonus tracks. Vinyl two, do you remember the live MTV San Bernardino Course, show? Of course, yeah. So that audio only existed on the Laserdisc. Oh. And who owns a Laserdisc anymore? Yeah, yeah. And VHS, who owns a VHS tape anymore? Right. So the only way you could hear that was on Laserdisc and VHS. So we stripped the audio off and put it on the second album and how about any uh like booklet or anything oh uh, well there's a lot of there's some cool photos and then there's a deep in-depth interview by a british journalist and a brand new interview talking to all the band members about their experiences good or bad or mediocre in the in the gatefold so i'll bring in the i mean, I'll, the package is, is really it's yeah a beautiful awesome package that's great so that's the 40th anniversary of stay hungry People ask me about what the plans are in the future for other releases. Well, we did a 40th anniversary of Under the Blade. And we Great. We did a 40th of, of, of Stay Hungry. So now the question is, what happened to You Can't Stop Rock and Roll? Well, there's ideas for You Can't Stop Rock and Roll, which the label's going to have to figure. I have some great ideas to do it, and they should address those ideas. And then there's ideas for... Um, come out and play but for come out and play there was one track that only let was on the cassette and was not on the was not on the um i had the violin. cassette it was you have the cassette, so you have king of the fools right yeah that's, that's it a, yeah that's it so king of the fools has never been on on the vinyl oh it didn't make it on the vinyl didn't make it on the vinyl wow and we have someone sent me a video of us playing it on a german tv show and it's a motherfucker i mean i love that but i'll tell you a funny story about it, come out and play so we did um stay hungry i think the budget was 135,000 bucks and not expensive right so then now now we're super famous right yeah so we get dieter dirks right one million dollar and record goes, oh he goes twisted sister he goes now it's just new digital is out and we do all digital so he he brings in these two mitsubishi 31 track digital machines which it's the first all digital complete digital rec metal album I know. So he brings these machines in and they're really big and the budget's ridiculous, right? So I look at Dieter and I said to Dieter, why are we, you know, like this is 1985. I said, uh, so the budget's insane. Why do we have to do this? He goes, oh, the digital, the digital is the best. It's the cleanest. I said, Dieter, I said, uh, but we're recording Marshall amplifiers at 100% distortion. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, but it'll be the cleanest distortion you ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> was, was that guy the original Warriors guy? Uh, uh, on the, Oh, the, God, no, we tried to get that guy. Yeah. That was D. Oh, it was D. Yeah, we tried to get Twisted Sister to come out and play. I yeah, think, yeah. I think we tried to get him, but he wanted too much money. I mean, we did the song Be Cruel to Your School. So yeah. on the song, so who's guests on that? Billy Joel guests on it. Uh -huh. Clarence Clemens guests on it. Wow. Alice Cooper guests on it. 
And Chuck Berry wanted him to do the guitar solo because it's a 50s rock and roll song. So we heard that Chuck Berry would only do it if you paid him $17,500 in cash in yeah. a brown paper bag. Yeah. Well, that was a rumor. That was the rumor, right? So he was playing on Long Island. So we went out to see him. And he said, yeah, man, $17,500 in a brown paper bag. Otherwise, no. And we went... There's no way the record label's going to give us $17,500. So Brian Setzer played the guitar. Wow. I'm sorry. Not exactly a fallback, not a, a poor fallback, one of the greatest guitar players in rock and roll. Oh, yeah. So you got Brian Setzer, Alice Cooper, Clarence Clemens, and Billy Joel all played on Be Cruel to Your School. Fuck. And that would have been a fun track to release. I mean, we made, you know, you look back at history and you go, what mistakes? What were our biggest mistakes we made? And that's what happens, man. That's what happens. But look, the band, luck, luck, luckily, had a rebirth in 2003 and then came back for like 16 glorious years and the Christmas album. So we came back from the precipice. You know, when the band ended, uh, we were in debt to the record label. I mean, you're gonna, for anybody in the music business who doesn't understand the math of the music business, it's a rude awakening when you oh, understand yeah. the math of the, the music business. It's like the film business. You know, how's it gross X millions and they're still in debt? You know, magically you're still in debt. So we were in debt for millions. And then D and I were sued on top of that for uh, by Winterland um, um, Merch merchandise. Merch for it, an advance? It, well, what happened was the first $3 million advances in the history of the music business was Twisted Sisters, Springsteen, and Madonna. They gave each one of us a million bucks. So Madonna goes out and makes a kajillion, right? Springsteen goes out and makes a kajillion. We signed a personal services agreement. I mean, when we signed it, I thought, what's the chance of it bombing? It's not going to bomb. We have never bombed. Twist has always come back and always done ridiculous business. This is our time. This is going to be huge. We're going to make a, a jillion dollars. So we signed a personal services contract, not thinking that if somebody could actually go well, you owe me this money. Well, the tour didn't go well, and the band fell apart, and they came after us, me and D, and we both filed for, um, for bankruptcy. Fuck. So here I am in 19... 89, walking out of bankruptcy court uh, in Bowling Green, New York, and uh, having put, toge put together the band 80 th in 73 and watching it becoming one of the biggest bands in the world in 84, only to have to file personal bankruptcy in 1989 and start my life all over again. And uh, I laughed about it as I walked out of court at the absurdity of it. I kind of knew where this was going. It's not like it was a surprise to me. I mean, my overarching philosophy in this world, Dean, is that there's three kinds of people in this world. The people who make it happen, the people who watch it happen, and the people who say what happened. Yeah. And the people who say what happened is 99% of the population. That 1% either makes it happen or watch it happen. So I knew what was going on, and I knew this was our fate. And I walked out of the, um, of the bankruptcy court, and all I had left were two subway tokens, a guitar, and the trademark Twisted Sister because I still owned the name. And the judge um, was interesting because the judge was sitting there going, uh, I think my name was still Seagal legally at the time. And I was going through a divorce at the same time because everything always happens at the same time though. When your life, when it caves in, it caves in. And he says to me, um, so uh, <clears throat> obviously you have this trademark. And I, why can't I I'll just take it and give it to all these people? You owe this, I'll give it to American Express and Winterland. And I said, you could, but it's worthless. And he said, what do you mean it's worthless? I said, do you know anything about pop culture? And he said, no. I said, we're well, yesterday's news. I said, it's totally worthless. He said, yeah, but I know who you are. I said, yeah, you know who I am, but you must admit that a movie, you, sometimes you read that a movie costs 100 million bucks and it bombs, and it shouldn't have bombed. It's got the biggest stars, biggest director, great budget, but it bombs, right? He goes, yeah. I said, and Broadway shows with the best actors, best books, bomb, right? He goes, yeah. I said, well, Twisted Sister. I said, everything looked perfectly aligned, and the thing cratered. I said, so were yesterday's news. But six months before that hearing, I was in England visiting my soon-to-be second wife's parents, and I'm sitting in their living room, and I'm watching telly, the telly, right? And there's a commercial for Tide detergent. And in this commercial, there's a sexy guy, and he takes a shirt off, and there's a hot chick in the laundromat, and he throws a shirt in the laundry, and adds Tide detergent. And the music they played behind it was Stand By Me by Benny King, the original Stand By Me from 1960. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is 1988, right? Well, England is a wacky country. 
the record label re-released the Stand By Me, and it went to number one. Only yeah. in England can they do that, like wacky stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking, wow, man, music and commercials. What a great concept. So I said to the judge, I said, Your Honor, look. I said, the, I said, the name is worthless today. I said, but you know what? In 10 years, maybe I could get Tide Detergent to license. We're not going to take it. I said, and if I did that, maybe I'd put band, band back together. And I said, if I did that, maybe I'd be remarried. And if I did that, maybe I'd have a kid. And if I did that, I need money to send the kid to college. That's why you should let me keep the name. And he looked at me and he went, okay, that's a very good argument. You can keep the name. And this is, I swear, hand to God, 10 years to the month of that statement. We're not going to take it. it was licensed by Comtrex nasal spray. It's the first <laughs> product to ever license. We're not going to take it. Wow. And now we are, you know, 24 years later and one of the most licensed songs in history. So, yeah. So when we talk about the dues we pay and yeah. what we never expect, how life can have its weirdness, you know, it's, it's, definitely, had its, it's definitely had its weirdness for me. I never... Remember, in 1988, if you ask me, what does Twist's value? It's less than nothing. Yeah. And I recently told you we did like a gangbuster deal with, I won't get into specifics, but let's just say it's not, <laughs> let's just say it turned out to be worth a lot. Yeah, yeah. A, a lot. And, and, but, but it was a testament to the band's hard work. You know, the band worked, continually worked. Of course. You can't get around it. You got to put the dues in for it. Now, let me ask you about this special that you got coming up. Yeah. Talk. A You're little. the only guy that saw it, by the I'm way. I'm the only person that saw it, and it's gorgeous looking. When do you think it's going to get out there? What, what is your plan for this special? Well, we finish. Uh, as soon as I'm done with this podcast, I have to watch it again, the new almost final cut. And then if it's there, then we start making appointments to go shop it around. And then there's no way it's not going to sell because this thing... Is like nothing you've ever seen. Nothing like you ever. It's like going to the sphere. Yeah. It's the sphere of comedy. Do you it, know what I'm saying? It's so like right away, people are going to go, have you seen that special in the cave? Bottom line. And there's so many other stories behind it. Josh Homme doing the music. You know, me, 58, doing the special on my own, you know? Uh, nobody giving me a special and starting comedy at 44 and... All of these stories that any smart person would go, oh, we're going to tell all these stories to promote this special, you know? So we're going to shop it around and then, we'll, you know, we'll uh, see who buys it. And then I'm going to shoot a, another one in June, a 30 minute in June. Same location, different location? No, different location. Have you been to the Sphere, by the way? Oh, God. It's, it's game over for all these other venues. Game over. Game over. Once yeah. you go there, you're like, other than, say, the Hollywood Bowl or the, uh, the, the prestige of the Forum and the Garden, other than that and, the, and Red Rocks, it's over. Yeah. Because if you go to that place, I was doing a bit on it a little bit, and I'll try to get it going again, but it's like, good luck, uh, you know, after that, because you'll be like, oh, oh, this ain't the sphere. You know what I mean? You know, it's funny, the next night, I was in Vegas, yeah. and Ringo was playing um, at the Venetian. Now, Ringo's a Beatle, so yeah. you know what? I mean, how many more years are you going to see a Beatle? Of course, he's 82 so or something. He's 82 years old, and, you know, and, I, and I was with a friend of mine, and I said, I don't care. It doesn't need to be the sphere. I'm watching Ringo Yeah, one more time, and I'm totally cool with it. But the bottom line is it was just a plain old show, and it was just a band on stage. The sphere, but here's the problem with the sphere. Yeah. Who could play the sphere? I mean, that's the other, a friend of mine, I missed seeing Dave Gilmore, right? Right. We just talked about it, but you saw and how ridiculous. Imagine that at the Sphere. He probably will wind up at the Sphere. I think so. It because he did nine shows in America. That's it. Some people say that's going to be it forever. I don't believe that. I think he did the You mean nine. the five shows he did in, at the Garden? Yep, five and, and then four here. That, and you know that that replicates what Pink Floyd did with the original wall. Do you right, know about that? exactly. It's they the same one. five in, yep. in and Nassau LA Coliseum, Coliseum and five out here. Yep. And that was it. Yeah. Yeah, because that thing was fucking insane. And I was at two of those shows. Wow. At, the, at Nassau. So anyway, I didn't know that. I thought he was doing a whole full nope. tour. Nope. Nine dates. That's it. But there is a handful of people, I think, that... Well, here's the problem with the Sphere. You don't just go, okay, we're at the Sphere next week. Uh, you know, 
because what it is is the visuals. And it takes – you hire a team, and I believe that you two and Dead & Co. use the same team. I think Eagles used a different team. And there's been some complaints I heard that the Eagles – uh, visuals were a little generic. Um, I don't know. I, I I haven't seen it, so I'm not gonna. The uh, Deads were mind blowing. Oh, the Deads were completely it, mind blowing. It was it it was just like I still think about that and you too. Like sometimes I'll just be sitting around. I'll be like, oh, I can't fucking believe what that venue is. But it really takes people like Bono and Edge to like okay. Show us what we can do. And they've been fucking ahead of anybody. With that goddamn Octung Baby Tour uh, and the Pop Tour, they were the first ones with the mega screens. They were the first ones with fucking, you know. Stages that were gigantic. Insane visual shit. They didn't give a fuck. They just threw all their money. We wanted the best shows ever. Yeah, I remember reading something about like it cost them 880000 a day just the yeah. cost of keeping the show out there. Yeah. And if you're not working, it still costs you $880,000 a day because they, yeah. they had double stages to be able to hopscotch all over the place. So when they did that 18-month tour in which he had the back operation, yeah. they were losing money for the first nine months of that tour. Yeah. But anyway, so to your point, so state of the art. they don't fuck around. And then I think that Dead & Co., their crowd is so into psychedelics and everything that they're like, what can we do to really turn this fucker upside and down? They did it, man. Yeah. Wow, did they do it? And I think the people that can do it are people like Tool, who have a huge culty uh, following that uh, they have crazy visuals at their show already. You know, Fish did it. Um, did you see Fish? I didn't see Fish. Okay. I'm not a fish guy. Um, and they only did four nights or something like that. So that's interesting because the amount of work you have to put into the visuals, they say you don't even start making money until like the third week there. Right, right, right. So right, because right. of the visuals. Because the, the money, the, the development of the digital creation right. is so far beyond what anyone could ever imagine. I right. mean, the dead, look, you can say what you want to say about the dead, you know, yeah. blah, blah. But man... Uh, this is what I'll say about the dead. They were there in the beginning when the first light shows occurred back in the 60s. So they pioneered the original. My favorite, the Josh oils. Light show, right, all that oh. shit. They pioneered that. And they were together long enough to pioneer the greatest example of visual technology. And by the way, if Floyd was around, it would be a perfect Pink Floyd. Oh, oh my God. And I'm sure Roger Waters is going to end up doing it. You know, like he can do like a. A wall without the wall. Yeah. Without the building it. Because yeah. I saw the last wall, you know? Well, so did I. It so, was very impressive. Great. Very impressive. But you can really be up. It's so, it's virtual reality goggles without goggles. It looks so fucking real at some point. I was doing a bit where I was saying, like, if you're new on psychedelics, you don't <laughs> go and take psychedelics at the sphere. This is for seasoned acid heads. Because at one point I saw a motorcycle coming out. Yeah. And I saw an old hippie go, no. He was like, yeah. And he had taken acid all his life. You know what oh, I mean? A hundred percent. That whole scene with the with that motorcycle guy. Coming Unbelievable. At you, I'm sitting dead center in the sphere. Yeah. Right in line with that motorcycle. Yeah. And, and I'm train. saying to myself, oh my God, if I was wasted, yeah. it would be too much. That's what I'm saying. It would be way, way, way. Yeah, like, yeah. You don't need to be yeah. on drugs. Man. Yeah, That's no. A, well, know? I had a handful of mushrooms for uh, you too. Right. Because I took them at the Octung Baby Tour. So I go, well, I'll take these in a minute. And uh, once they get started, because I don't know the venue and I want to get my bearings. Well, when they came on, I just put them in my pocket. I go, I don't need these. No. I was taking these to get there. I'm already there. You're already there. It's absolutely the month. We told, so I'm going back. I'm going to go so back. So am I. To, March. I'm going back to see the Eagles. So let me, like, there's yeah. no PA. People don't understand. You no, don't see no PA. a PA. You don't see a PA. The entire time. place is speakers. Yeah. The entire place. They're in your seat. They're behind those screens. They're in the walls. 
You can't believe the fucking sound. You know, they're building a second sphere. You know I know, in Dallas in Dubai, no, and Dubai. Dubai. Yeah, now they say Dallas also. Like two point, well, first of all, someone said New York. I said, you can't buy can't enough do. land. You can't do it. No, no. You would never do it. Yeah, you can do it outside of Jersey where that uh, mall failed, that super mall. Oh, yeah, maybe. like, But you need space. Yeah, right. right but get, it'd be great right there. Space. Oh, my God. Because uh, it's just mind-boggling how it is. So it kind of has... So I heard the same thing about the Eagles. I heard... Someone said to me, well, you've seen the dead. The Eagles is not going to be that. I said, if you right. didn't see the dead, the Eagles will probably blow course, you away. Of course. But course. you saw yeah. the dead. Yeah. And it's going to probably, I said, but I'm going with a bunch of other people who never were there. It'll be before. great. Anytime yeah. you go to the sphere, I don't give a fuck who's playing. You know what I mean? It's going to be great. Because you could just forget about the band and be like, whoa, look at that, man. You no, know, they're going to do, I think, um, are they going to do like dance, uh, like e uh, EM, what is it? Um, Oh, like EDM. EDM. Yeah, they parties. did the UFC in there. That was crazy. Really? Yeah. They did the UFC in there. Is it, wait, is tomorrow night Tyson versus? Yeah, yeah. Got to see that. <laughs> okay. Wow. All right, before crazy. we get out of here, let's talk hearing aids. Oh, God. All right. Let's talk. So, the aids. only reason I wanted to talk to you about them. Okay. These are the latest. I like, now, do your glasses, does it sit on? Because the only reason I ever went the in-ear one, because I tried hearing aids like a year ago, yeah. was because my glasses... Always hit it. Yeah, yeah they I do. And I, you can hear them. Like, yeah, I don't like that. Still do. Well, one day, they're going to come up with a great just in-ear one. Yeah, oh. the problem with that and the reason why they haven't... and You know about Apple's new yep. iPods yeah, that yeah, also yeah. are hearing aids? Yep. So, look, the, the problem is this. The technology to make it look like it's not in your ear. Right. It's not the same as having an earpod sticking out of your ear. Of course. So if you care, if you don't care what someone looks like, then having a big piece of technology sticking out of your ear can probably be perfectly fine. Great. 240 bucks, I'm sure it works great. Right. If you want something that doesn't look like it's sticking out of your ear. So I'm currently beta testing, truthfully, me and Paul Simon, actually. Wow. Only because our audiologist is the same audiologist. Yeah. And so I was called up and the president of Starkey, which is one of the top companies um came up with these latest designs so i'm beta testing these latest ones now you pop them right out yeah okay i got some right here hold on let me see here now uh this is the where are they i don't know where they're at but anyway i had some here and i'll tell you the scariest thing for me was i wore them for two days yeah and then i took them out and holy shit was that brutal it was complete, you know, because I'm back to my hearing. Right. It took like four hours for me to, my brain to wrap around to the shitty hearing again. So you're not wearing anything right no. now? No. Okay. I tested hearing aids for a year. Right. Six different manufacturers. Uh -huh. I picked the ones I used to wear. Right. And then I had them for a year. But I was having technical problems with them. They were cutting out too much. Whenever I got a phone call, I'd have to reset them. Right, like, yeah. Too much of a pain in the ass. That's what my buddy has going right now. Bad Bluetooth. Yeah, Bluetooth. So these latest Starkeys um, remedy a lot of the connectivity issues so they stay connected. What most people don't understand and what they can't grasp is, is that if you allow your phone to be your control unit, if your phone dies, yeah. then whatever it was set at at the time the phone died is where it's stuck at at the time that you last used the hearing right. aid. Also, the batteries didn't last that long. Right. Now these new batteries last long. The, 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 uh, the, 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 the audio profile on these is much more advanced. It seems that every six months there's another advancement. And they have to because, first of all, they're the most overpriced pieces of shit on the planet. Of course, yeah. totally. Seven grand Seven bullshit. Grand. Seven grand. Yeah. I mean, look... I'm a celebrity. Yeah, of course. So he's going to cut me a break or something, but the fact is, it shouldn't be like that. No. But my hearing is seriously bad. But what I'm saying is, when you take them out, oh. don't you freak out? Like, oh my kind God, of, I can't hear it all yeah. right now. Yeah, but yes. And I'm always, you know, the joke is with your wife, is like 90% of marriage is saying what from another room. Of course, room, yeah. Right? Like, that's bad enough to begin with. But I do notice that we lose the sibilances, we lose the Ks, the Ss, the Is, those words. And when I take them out, it's really like, but I'll tell you this, when I'm at a rock show, yeah. I take them out. Of and course. And I put plugs in my ears. Oh, yeah, same here. Another problem, too, which most people don't understand, you walk down the street, 
and a fire engine or a police car comes by with the sirens oh. and your head fucking explodes. Oh. You've got and a, in New York, it's all day. All day. All day. It's all fucking day. Yeah. So you're constantly pulling them out of your head. Oh. People don't talk about the practical realities of them. Right. So there's still, from a technical standpoint, a lot. I think in five years, I'll, I'll give in to them and I think they'll be so fucking far or... They'll have some stem cell or whatever and build new eardrums. Well, I think that they're getting, I think that, I think digitally they're getting better. But a friend of mine has one that are implanted in your ear. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you actually, you have to have a specialist put it in. Yeah. And the specialists take it out. Like once it's in, it's in and they take it out. And he seems to be kind of happy with them. But the thing is, it's so small. And right. they have not developed the technology enough yet. But they will. Yeah, they will. That's what I'm saying. It's in five there. years, it's going to be crazy. It's getting there. And our generation... Yeah, we need it's them. getting there. Yeah. I mean, do, w when your hearing is tested, your last hearing test, how, oh, how bad is She it? just said, how are you even hearing? She said, you, you are deaf. I'm immediately writing you a, a prescription for hearing aids, you know? And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I already knew that. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, my wife said to me, this was when it all started like five years ago. She goes, you know, the problem with you is you got dementia. Oh yeah, and you're deaf and you're not paying any attention to me. Yeah. And she she goes, you have she says you have dementia or Alzheimer's. Yeah, and so I and so I happen to have a doctor's appointment that week because I'm Jewish, so it means I always have a doctor's appointment. So I say to my doctor, my wife says I have dementia. My doctor said to me, John, if I had a dollar for every sixty year old guy who comes in here and tells me that his wife says he had dementia because I could fucking retire. Yeah. He goes, if I show you car keys, and you recognize them as car keys. You don't have dementia. If yeah. you don't know what they are, I'll send you to NYU to be, I guess, but I want you to send you an audiologist. The audiologist comes and does a two-hour test and comes out. She goes, well, Mr. French, considering your age and your occupation, your hearing is, 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 is this, was, this was a while back. This was not that bad. He goes, so tell your wife the good news is your hearing is not that bad. The bad news is you're not paying any attention to her. Yeah. And that's another thing, too. You know what it is? Women's voices fall in the yeah. area that we don't hear. Yeah, we talked about that. Bill yeah, had a did, Bill yeah. had a bit about that. It's true. You know, uh, they say now that you should wear hearing aids because it will bring on Alzheimer's or one the, of those. The lack of it brings, right? and you know why? Because you start feeling very self-conscious. You start to drift back into your... Listen, going to restaurants. Yeah. Restaurants are so noisy. Oh, it's brutal. I hate them. <laughs> and then the sound behind you. Oh, yeah. So now these hearing aids have programs that block out the sound behind you. Right. And right. focus in in front of you. So you like them? Um, I like these better right like but, i'm beta testing these do they sound right tin canny though the ones i put in they were like tin cans it no. was just like oh, can, 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 can. i could hear good but it was like all oh, right yeah okay, if you have a cotton swab with some alcohol uh -huh. i'll clean it and you can put them in and, and, and really just to see what you, what they think yeah i mean if you want to just try it. oh yeah i want to try it i'll do that like right. just pop in your ear and just tell me what you're hearing because even in its basic setting yeah so right now I mean, people can't see us from doing a podcast. Yeah. So right now, I'm looking at my phone. I'm going into my Starkey um, app. Okay, yeah. here we go. My Starkey app. Uh -huh. So you've, I've got... Okay, I hate when you touch a button on a phone and you throw the whole fucking thing yeah. off. <laughs> okay, hold on. JJ okay, French is go. getting old man right now here, on the phone. Here we go. So yeah. we've got like... Four programs. Yeah. I got personal. Yeah. I got restaurant. Ah, uh, yeah. I've seen I like those. I have yep. music, right? So yep. I'm on personal. Uh -huh. And then on personal, you push this button, and it's analyzing the environment. Yeah, I've seen and, that. And now I've got, like, enhanced speech, so I can, it's even right, better. Right, right, right. It's better. All right, I'll try it out. So, uh, yeah, so this is the future. This is our future. All right. Well, there you go. JJ yeah. French, 40th anniversary of Stay Hungry is out right now. Go back and listen to the first time I had him on years ago when I was living in New York and I went to his uh, house, saw his stereo and the place he grew up and he still lives in right now. And uh, you're gonna pry that apartment out of my cold, dead fingers. Yeah, right yeah. Now. Oh God, yeah. I love that story. <laughs> and then uh, also check me out on JJ French's podcast, which came out about six months ago. Yeah. And that the is French Connection. A French Connection. Yeah, and he's got music. that book I got sitting over there. JJ French, Twisted, Twisted business. business. Look how good my glasses are. I can see it. Twisted Business. And uh, I love you, man. It's always great to have you in LA. What a great gig. You're like a neighbor. I know. Me. It's so fucking you weird, right? Yeah. You're a neighbor to me. I'll be in New York soon and we will hang. Yeah, absolutely. And go get some life. food. And uh, everybody, if you're listening to this, 
I am uh, starting my California tour today with Mr. Bill Burr. We will be in Bakersfield, Visalia, Modesto, Stockton, and Fresno. So come see us this week. Thank you. Candles are lit.